I'm Peter Bergen, Vice President of Global Studies and Fellows at New America. Uh, our panel uh, it consists of Candice Rondo, uh, who is Director of the Future Frontlines Program at New America, former Washington Post Bureau Chief in uh, Kabul, uh, covering extremism in Afghanistan and Pakistan, worked for International Crisis Group uh, in, in Afghanistan, um, U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, is also a professor of practice at Arizona State University, where she is uh, working with Sean Walker, who is uh, also a professor at Arizona State University, focusing on in information. Uh, uh, Shannon, Shannon Hiller, who is at Princeton, also a member of this research consortium. Uh, she is co-director of the Bridging Divides Initiative at Princeton University. Uh, and finally, Jared Holt, who's also a member of this research consortium. He's a resident fellow at the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensics Research Lab, and he's a former uh, investigative reporter who covered right-wing extremists and, and terrorists. So, uh, Candace, can I kind of uh, turn it over to you to give us an overview of kind of what the project and the consortium, uh, what questions is trying to answer and, and where, where you are collectively in, in the work? Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, so we, um, a lot of the folks on this um, webinar today and uh, several more from different organizations who are researchers, practitioners, um, people with connections to policymakers, um, began discussing um, informally uh, what we were seeing in you know, various data streams, uh, both online and offline, um, leading up to the events of January 6th. Um, several of us um, on the day on January 6th immediately began responding when there was a call put out um, for volunteers to begin collecting social media data from the storming of the Capitol on the day. Um, and since then, we have sort of been discussing and exchanging uh, information and views on how to proceed with this very complex research into exactly what happened on, on January 6th, but also, you know, what happened leading up to that. Um, and so um, it, we'll hear from Shannon and Jared and, and Sean a little bit more about that. Uh, but where we are right now, you know, especially with our research, um, is we've begun looking at influencers, uh, you know, influencers and micro influencers who are really key to stoking uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, anxiety and, and the political grievances that we saw expressed leading up to January 6th, including, you know, folks like uh, Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell. Uh, you know, uh, Mike Flynn and, and others. And a lot of what we're seeing, you know, is not too surprising. Social media played a really big role. Um, and so that's a big part of the research that we're doing. And I'll let the others also talk a little bit about what they're doing. Well, and, and it, uh, we should note that Nancy Pelosi just announced the select committee to look into what happened on January 6th. And, and I also see that Rudy Giuliani's law uh, license has just been suspended in New York for false claims he made about the 2020 election. Um, turning it over to Sean Walker, who's a professor at Arizona State. Um, um, Sean, how do, you, how, did, how do you plug into this, this work? I'm uh, sure my work's primarily around looking at some of the social media data and also trying to join some of this online and offline data. One of the big challenges that we're finding is that a lot of the social media platforms, so the mainstream platforms like Facebook and Twitter are trying to moderate some of this content by some of these actors. So that means every time we gather this data, we kind of get different data and some of those pieces are ephemeral. So they're kind of disappearing. And we're also seeing a lot more activity on what we call more fringe platforms like Parler and Gab and Telegram and such. And that data is even harder to access, but that only paints part of the picture, right? We have this sort of public facing picture that's happening online in mainstream and in fringe social media. But then we also have these pictures that we're trying to gather of all this offline activity and all this behind the scenes activity and email and WhatsApp and text messages and those things. So combining those pictures together to try to see how information flows between the platforms um, and within the platforms is something that we're trying to do, but is actually a pretty difficult task and is something that's kind of hard to access. Um, and also we note that a lot of these movements like QAnon and such are using um, these different signals than what we normally see in like marketing and such, right? Content that's going viral is less interest to these groups. Uh, we are more interested in you know, very specific signals that are lower volume and different kinds of signs and other things that are more difficult to pick up. And a lot of the tools aren't designed to do that yet. Great. Um, Shannon, how, how do you plug into this? Sure. Uh, well, um, you know, 
Bridging Divides was really set up to focus on tracking and mitigating broader political violence, especially ahead of the last election. Um, and uh, with a focus on how do you get that data and information to communities to do something about it before things escalate. Um, in tracking those trends, um, just as Candace said, there were a lot of us who were talking ahead of election day itself, heading into inauguration. The fact that um, trends around demonstrations uh, relating to COVID, anti-COVID um, restriction demonstrations, the backlash to the huge surge in Black Lives Matter and social justice demonstrations through the summer, and then heading into around the election, um, uh, demonstrations there. So, so we did a report, for example, looking at all the demonstrations between November 4th and January 20th. Um, and only 3% had some type of like explicit contention, but the vast majority of those were stop the steal. Um, and those, those uh, demonstrations though were in 50 states. So part of what we think a lot about is, you know, communities have been dealing with these dynamics for a long time, uh, whether it's COVID, stop the steal or armed intimidation of uh, social justice demonstrators. And so, you know, where I think of a glimmer of hope and I know we're gonna talk a little bit more about is, a lot of the folks here have been collaborating for, to think about how do we get this information into the hands of folks who are looking for, for answers for how to address this, not just around January 6th, but all the things that led up to and we're seeing after it. Great, thank you. And, so, and Jared, how, how, does your, how do you fit into all this? Uh, yeah, so uh, at the TFR lab, we were doing some work with Georgetown's uh, Institute for Constitutional uh, Advocacy and Protection, because as Shannon noted, uh, we saw a spring and a summer that was painted by this uptick in uh, extremist public showings. So you had militias going to racial justice protests. Uh, there were some conflicts and there were some concerns that through armed intimidation or, or other means uh, that there would be efforts to intimidate voters at polling places. Um, so I was working with ICAP and trying to keep an eye on different extremist movements and uh, especially in key areas where uh, there was already some contention and incidents recorded uh, to try to monitor that. And then that monitoring continued after the you excuse me, after the election, um, as, you know, results were coming in and as we, you know, didn't have an election night where a winner was clear and these narratives started to bubble up. So, um, you know, nowadays I'm really interested when we're talking about January 6th that looking at sort of the nexus between the more formalized groups um, that have, you know, large uh, bank accounts of funding and access to influence and also and sort of where the overlap is with organized extremist groups um, because you know these groups often have very different visions um, very different goals but you know for the time being they had set aside their differences and worked together towards this uh, common project and you know I, I think there are still a lot of questions that remain to be answered about the the nature of the communication between those, uh, you know, different flavors of the day, if you will. Well, let me ask each, each one of you, kind of, what are your top line conclusions? Since the, the question we're trying to answer is in this panel is what happened on January six, and I guess we all know what happened. But it kind of um, was this all a long time coming? To what extent was this planned? What extent was this kind of spontaneous? To what extent was to what extent were any of you surprised by this? And we'll start with Candace and we'll just kind of do, do a round robin. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I mean, I think, you know, we've been talking a lot, I think amongst, you know, a lot of the researchers who have been looking at the events of January 6th and also just election violence more generally and the unrest in the United States over the last year or so, year and a half. Um, you know, there are a lot of known knowns, uh, you know, to use the Rumsfeldian, uh, you know, frame. We know that a lot of people, you know, participated in the event, right? We know that a lot of them um, came from all over the country, and they had many of them uh, had participated in other events in, in, you know, state capitals, as as Shannon mentioned. Um, there are some known unknowns. Uh, we don't really know um, to what degree there was coordination between uh, groups like the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, um, you know, and other, you know, the Three Percenters. 
that have become so prominent in terms of the number of arrested folks and charged folks um, you know, in connection with the investigation into January 6th. And we don't really fully understand um, the role of these big influencers, as I mentioned, um, but they clearly played some important part, even though some of them weren't physically present on the day. Um, and quite a few of them, uh, you know, including Mike Flynn uh, and a couple of others, it seemed like their accounts, um, you know, their social media accounts went dark on the day, uh, which is a little bit unusual. You would think that on that day of all days, um, they would be more active. Uh, and so some of the things we are looking into are sort of, you know, what happened there? Um, what, were there other conversations going on on encrypted channels or lesser known channels? So those are some of the known unknowns. And then there are the unknown unknowns, which is essentially um, where is this movement heading? Um, you know, to what degree will the, the investigations both in, in the courtroom and then also this uh, select committee um, that Nancy Pelosi has just announced you know, where will that take the movement next? To, to what degree will it serve to create a common narrative about what happened and what it means, um, or you know, end up dividing the country even further and creating, um, I think, more of a, a tailwind for some of these extremist groups? Sean? Well, I would be, I'm, I'm surprised and not surprised. I mean, there's lots of signals that something was happening um, the fact that it turned into such a punctuated event, I think, is maybe the shocking part um, to see that. But I would argue that this is part of a long arc, and this event is kind of a, a punctuated event within that longer arc, because we can see in the movement this is a, a bit of a, a marriage between some interesting folks um, besides the influencers, but we also see in kind of the underlying movement, um, you know, anti-vaxxers, you know, COVID, QAnon, uh, militias coming together um, in ways that, you know, we may not have seen in the past. Um, and we continue to see uh, that relationship kind of form and, and closer, right? And we have white supremacy and other things are, are joined into this. So right now, you know, we're still kind of pulling apart, right? You know, even though often in the media, it says that there are like floods of data about this, um, the data about before and after the event is much uh, difficult to get access to. Um, there is a big effort to collect event, you know, that data in real time, um, how reliable some of that data is, right? That's sorting that out for research purposes to be able to make claims is something that's a, a big issue of, um, you know, crowdsourced data. You know, how do we contextualize that to then, you know, come to findings? But I think this is a, a long arc that's that hasn't finished, and that you know they're still planning for other uh, events ahead. They've moved to new platforms, right? We have this kind of idea of the new parlor versus the old parlor that was deplatformed. That you know, old parlor well kind of disappeared. Right, New Parlor is still very active, um, and we see some of the same players that we saw pre-January 6th and the pre-deplatformer of Parlor are really uh, big players right now, and they're continuing to um, stir up. You know, we also see connections to the Arizona audit and other states um, that are doing the audit. So I think the arc has just begun, sadly, um, and monitoring that arc, I think, is something that's you know researchers and policymakers have to work really hard on because getting access to this is still difficult. John? Sure. Well, you know, as, as Jared already mentioned, one of the things that we've thought a lot about is the nexus between you know, what gets a lot of headlines, the organized groups, and should be uh, investigated, but and the fact that there were a lot of individuals and people, the majority of people, I believe, um, uh, like facing charges so far, were not affiliated with specific armed groups or um, organizations, and that may develop. But um, and one of the things we looked into recently is looking back over the past year, as you heard already, we had, you know, uh, COVID demonstrations, uh, social justice demonstrations, the election, all these dynamics leading in. Um, and one of the things we saw was the ways in which the behavior at those demonstrations carried through into January 6th and are carrying through after. Um, you know, we, we, we're about to release um, a, a short brief that focuses on those unaffiliated actors, and well over 90% of them were in.
were in direct opposition to uh, Black Lives Matter demonstrations. And that was, there's layers of why that was bring why people were coming out for that. You know, one is the longstanding tradition of, of opposing racial justice um, advances in this country um, through behavior like that. But the other is that supercharged dynamics um, that we've talked about. And then on top of that, missing disinformation driving real fear um, of things like Antifa buses um, uh, coming to suburban neighborhoods that we didn't see materialize, but did bring people out onto the street and carried over into January 6 and now. So, um, you know, I, I, I shared Sean's flag and, and concern about the fact that if we don't uh, find a way to, to, to create a, a closer shared narrative um, coming out of January 6th, what actually happened, um, then we'll just see more of these um, these dynamics uh, actually on the ground around things like um, you know the the uh, reviews and things in different states of the vote. And Jared, um, you know, kind of echo echoing what Sean said, I was not surprised that January sixth uh, was a ugly day, um, but I am surprised how far it went um, and, and how, you know, how specifically ugly that it was. And I, I think that, you know, uh, collectively, we maybe still don't appreciate how bad things could have been, um, you know, as we're looking at charging documents and finding out about, you know, stockpiled weapons, for example, or people communicating, you know, their desires to kill or, or harm politicians, um, you know, there was, you know, it's one of those situations where, you know, an extra two minutes here or a fail, you know, a certain decision not being made here uh, by a Capitol Police officer, for example, you know, these little, you know, the, the fact that the attempt at insurrection was unsuccessful and that more people didn't get hurt really hinges on these small moments um, and small decisions that were made. So, so you, go ahead. Oh, I, you know, and that being said, to kind of echo what, uh, you know, others have already touched on, like Shannon was saying, there were organized groups that were taken seriously that, you know, ritualize and, uh, you know, plan to conduct events, uh, violent events or to unleash violence, but sort of a larger reckoning um, is that arc that we were talking about, which is that, you know, January 6th was kind of the byproduct of a larger movement um, that began really earnestly climbing uh, last spring and landed on the steps of the Capitol. Um, and, and that arc is still ongoing. You know, there are still millions of Americans in this country that look at January 6th and don't think anything bad happened or think it was justified. Uh, you know, there's ongoing attempts by uh, commentators and even some elected officials to try to revise the history of that day, um, which, you know, I think all of that kind of underscores that the importance to, you know, get good data and be able to really, uh, you know, fill in all the details and tell the full story of what happened on January 6th before and after. Um, because, you know, sounds silly, but the G.I. Joe uh, slogan, knowing it's half the battle, right? So um, if you were um, advising Nancy Pelosi, I mean, what were the, uh, just anybody can jump in, what were the top two questions that you'd like answered, you know, other than the obvious ones, like what was the kind of sequence of events with the National Guard and the Pentagon and all those sorts of things. But leaving aside those sorts of questions, but in the kind of area that we're, we're discussing, the kind of organization of these movements and what are the questions that you think that they should be really honing in on? And since they have subpoena power, what can, who should they be, you know, who, what, who, should, they, who should they use the subpoena power uh, to bring before the committee? Hmm. Well, that's a, <laughs> now that's that last one is a pretty loaded question. Uh, I, I'll I'll start with the first and just um, you know some of the things that I've been wondering about just as Sean and I and others have been kind of digging through the data, um, things that jump out at me 
a lot of money flowed to from people to people in the run up to January 6. Um, there were different types of vehicles for transferring funds from you know individuals to groups um, or you know from you know groups to leaders and vice versa. Uh, example, you know we know about um, PayPal donations, um, Bitcoin uh, transfers uh, that we still don't know a lot about. Um, and there are of course a lot of theories that um, perhaps there, there are even, uh, foreign actors who in some way helped um, support those donations. And there's a lot of dark money out there. Um, that, the evidence of that is quite clear, um, you know, uh, from all the different higher level influencers who are closer to the Trump administration, uh, you know, their efforts to both you know, rally to stop the steel campaign, litigate and so forth and so on. Um, so I think those are important questions to be asking because, uh, you know, certainly, where dark money goes, um, you know, so too does disinformation nowadays. Um, it's not an automatic, but increasingly, I think we know, um, you know, that LLCs can be shell companies, that you can have all these different kinds of vehicles um, for transferring cash for favors that nobody can look in the dark box and see, right? So that's one big question to answer. Um, another that, you know, I'm certain it's, it's just a repeated theme that we've been struggling with now since at least 2016 is, you know, to what extent did foreign actors, uh, be it Russia or China or others, um, you know, play a role in amplifying a lot of the false narratives and the disinformation that stoked the flames, right? And we see even in our own research, uh, looking at Parler, you know, there's some pretty strange activity um, that seems to really tail with the activity of big influencers. And so, you know, the question, you know, I don't think we can say there's coordination or collusion or anything like that, but simply to say, um, you know, to what degree did the United States have a problem with uh, foreign actors like Russia uh, sort of using this moment, leveraging it to, to stoke even more division in the country? And what does that mean going forward? And then last, I would just say, you know, for tech companies, um, gosh, I mean, so many questions to be asked and answered in terms of their, uh, their efforts to take down content. Um, for instance, QAnon, of course, content was taken down a couple of months before the actual election day. Um, but we don't know anything about the methods. We don't know anything about the algorithmic, um, you know, design. We know nothing. It's, that is another black box. Um, that we've kind of allowed Twitter and Facebook to kind of um, sort of do a hand wave on. But the problem with that, of course, is um, we don't know what they know about what's really out there and how much it really syncs up with a lot of what the researchers are finding, uh, you know, in terms of pattern and, and, and trends in the data itself. So those are my questions. Yeah. Um Candace has, 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 has always made a, an excellent list, and I know Sean and Jared will add. Um, I would actually add a component of that question, uh, Peter, which is uh, how should um, questions be asked and, and individuals be pulled in? Uh, because I think in addition to accountability, in addition to truth telling about what happened on January 6th, one of the goals of the committee has to be trying to create a shared narrative across partisan um, perspectives. And you know, I think it's going to be a real challenge. But uh, without that, as I think someone already mentioned, there's just there's a continued risk that this further polarizes positions on what actually happened on January 6th. And as Candace already alluded to, uh, there won't be a single answer of what happened. There will be multiple layers of what brought people to that day and what resulted in, um, again, as as Jared already said, uh, a very close to a worse situation. Um, uh, and so I think uh, often it's hard to tell that story in a way that appeals across different audiences. Um, but I think that has to be a goal of, uh, of the committee. Sean, I'll jump in my, uh, my, my two questions, I guess. First off would be um, one that I haven't seen explored too much, which is that like, you know, what did the Trump White House know and when did they know it? Um, you know, various extremist figures and stuff have made claims of, of meeting with or talking with uh, people in the broader Trump administration orbit leading up to January 6th. Um, 
you you always have to take what extremists claim with like a huge grain of salt, though. Um, but I do think, given you know all things considered, it's worth at least trying to get to the bottom of the veracity of those claims. Um, and additionally, uh, the Trump digital team that was in the White House, um, you know, was very open about the fact that they scoured a lot of. Uh, you know, the forum boards and social communities where this kind of rhetoric was taking place. Um, so I, I would be curious to, you know, for a committee like this to kind of probe a little bit further into that aspect um, to, to kind of assess out, you know, what degree of, of knowledge was present there. Um, and, and then my second question would be, uh, where is all this data? Uh, why aren't social media companies sharing data, like everything they have with researchers? Um, because the digital component is not the only component, but it is a huge component. And, you know, I, I think that these large tech platforms, uh, you know, need to be active players in trying to get to the bottom of, you know, creating, creating a, um, as Shannon said, a shared narrative that, you know, can bridge, if possible, partisan uh, divides so that, you know, the United States can collectively assess, act if it's appropriate, and, you know, ultimately try to heal from this. And I'll just add, um, I, along with some researchers at ASU, like uh, Christy Rachi and Michael Simeone, we've been thinking about misinformation as it's useful. It's not necessarily contagious or because we're damaged or not informed. So a question in my mind is the misinformation that was spread that I think led to this event, whom was it useful to, right, and why? And I think that helps us address maybe some more of the root causes rather than think of people as, uh, like there's this trope, right, of, you know, members of QAnon or, or folks that went to the Capitol during the insurrection, right? That there's some sort of problem with them. There's some sort of mental illness. There's some sort of deficit. Um, but if we kind of flip that narrative and think, well, there's a reason why they're there. It's because this was useful to them and this was valuable to them. And the information that they believed and they decided to adopt and share was also valuable and useful. And that says a lot about the groups and what they're related to, like who do they believe? Uh, you know, we can early, go back to like earlier QAnon conspiracies, like the Wayfair child trafficking conspiracy, right? The, the, you know, members of law enforcement tried to, you know, basically quash that theory. But of course, if you don't trust law enforcement, then whatever they say doesn't matter. So I think that's another component too of, we want to know this information. Why was it valuable? To whom was it valuable? And when was it valuable? But also that tells us a little bit about who can speak to this, who can counter some of these narratives. How do we intercede? How do we change these configurations and relationships of, uh, of how we make a determination of value? The other question, and I know that, you know, as Jared said, you know, all the online information is not the be all end all, right? That's one slice. And that's actually a very specific slice that uh, has, a, it's, has a performative act to it, right? We, there is, it's a public performance. I think that's an important component and that explains a lot, that's not all of it. But I would ask of mainstream social media platforms, I would ask them information that they took down fairly quickly, right? There's a difference between information that never made it online because it was caught in their filters and that never circulated versus information that circulated for about 48 hours or less and was either removed by actors or removed by the platform. That's some of the most harmful and toxic content. And that disappears within a very short period of time, meaning it never gets fact-checked, meaning that it never enters the media in many cases and meaning that it disappears. So then we can't have a democratic conversation about that material. So basically it causes harm and then it disappears and then we're kind of lost, right? Um, so those are kind of, those are two questions that I would, uh, would think about in addition to the brilliant questions from my colleagues. Let me pick up on Sean's last observation. I mean, because if you're a social media company, obviously there's two ways you take down uh, information or, or uh, comments that are against the terms of service. One would be um, through algorithms and another one would be through, you know, having teams of people who are looking for this to, I mean, so, I mean, because I, 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 not not to defend social media companies uh, uh, in this context necessarily, but I mean, a lot of the pressure on them has been to take things down. So Sean, are you saying that they're taking things down too quickly and that's a bad thing? I didn't quite understand the, the logic there. No, I'm not saying they're taking things down too quickly. It's that 
a lot of the content that they do take down quickly um, already causes harm. I think in, in the public consciousness, we really don't look at or consider the harm that's caused by content moderation. And that's not saying that's not what we should do. It's just to say that everything has externalities and consequences that we do. There's not a perfect solution. We can think about going back to the pandemic video that was circulating earlier and is still circulating today. The fact that platforms were removing that content then filter like, well, what does the government not want us to know? What do platforms not want us to know? So that added a bit of this sort of edge, right? Like, you know, I want to know what that is and that made it more valuable. I'm not saying it should have circulated, like it shouldn't, it should have been gone. That was problematic, but there are consequences to every decision. There's no easy solution and not to give platforms, you know, uh, a free ride on this. Um, but it's, it's a very difficult problem. And they, you know, the, really the solutions they have with content moderation, right? We can label, but again, go back to the usefulness. If you don't trust a platform, then you're not gonna believe they're labeling. If you don't trust a fact checker, you're not gonna believe they're labeling. Like that's, that's a pretty weak intervention. Many of the interventions that we have are designed for folks that are not part of these extremist communities on either side. They're designed for folks that have high levels of trust in government, high levels of trust in the media, and high levels of trust in social media platforms. And I would argue the folks that went to the Capitol during the insurrection on January 6th, they don't meet either of the, any of those, right? That's not, you know, so interventions that focus on those groups are not gonna work, they're gonna fall flat. Um, so those two things, right? How do we intervene? But also how do we not lose track of all that content that's been removed. Social media platforms are not sharing this content with researchers. They might be sharing it with a few on the back end, but they're not sharing it with researchers and policymakers. So we can really understand like, what does the first 48 hours of some of this really toxic content that circulated, what's the impact of that? And we know that some of that content contributed to group membership, joining you know, QAnon, other groups, we know that that, that that contributed, but then it disappeared. So us as researchers, unless we were able to capture that in real time, we don't see those pieces. And that becomes a big gap in the findings from researchers and potentially the findings from the committee. Yeah, can I just quickly just jump in here? Um, because I think this is, Sean is like picking up on, some, on something really, really important, which is, you know, the, a lot of people kind of have heard about QAnon, right? Like, I mean, it's in the headlines all the time now. We got, you know, politicians in Congress, you know, who seem to be in some ways affiliated with it, but actually like the, the contours of the movement itself, the narratives are a little bit less well-known, right? And I think one of the things that we're finding as we kind of dig into it is a design feature of QAnon is to be, is to co-opt already extant conspiracy theories and kind of turn them on themselves and to co-op language that is pretty like anodyne, like great awakening, great storm. Like, what does that mean exactly, right? Um, nobody knows except for people who follow QAnon. And there's like 4,500 drops that we know of that, you know, these posts from Q uh, that, you know, that are out there, but that's just the base, right? We know that there are millions of followers now around the world. We've got Japanese QAnon, we've got German QAnon. Um, and it, even though the narrative is, is an American narrative, right, about some Americans, you know, in the White House doing things uh, having to do with, you know, crazy conspiracies. And so uh, the design features of these, um, of QAnon in particular, but other types of conspiracy oriented uh, movements are so uh, deceptive, right, and so malleable and adaptable that it does, I mean, it does challenge tech companies to really think about what are, not what is the content, but what are the design features that we need to address here? Um, and also, you know, even after January 6th, we saw things, I saw things, where QAnon uh, content was no longer with a Q, but it was with a KU. Right, these kind of adaptations are being run on platforms in order to get around the content moderation, uh, and again, that goes to the, de the design features themselves. And I think you know those are questions that the tech companies really have to answer. Well, uh, that raises an interesting question because one of the, as you as you all know, the White House released for the first time uh, just in the last what ten days ago, the first um, uh, you know government wide policy on domestic terrorism. 
And, and one of the things that it said, uh, one of the actual actions that it said it was going to take, which I think is very relevant to what Kat has just said and what you're all saying, is that it's going to uh, do a better job of telling local police departments and law enforcement kind of what the, symb what the symbology is, what the phraseology is, because, I mean, a lot of this stuff is pretty obscure, right, unless you follow it closely. Um, I mean, you've kind of just raised the point that Q can kind of morph into something else that isn't quite Q, but everybody kind of gets it. So um, how would you, anybody uh, just jump in, how would you score uh, what the White House is, is trying to do here? Obviously that's just one element of a much larger package. And obviously this is a very hard issue because a lot of these people are radicalizing individually as, as people have said already, without necessarily being part of a large group. Um, and, and that's just a, a hard law enforcement problem. Yeah, I mean, I'll yeah. start by saying just quickly, you know, I, I see, first of all, it's heartening to see the White House making the effort, um, you know, and I think, you know, the, the strategy um, has a lot of elements that really address some of the, the multivaried uh, spokes of the wheel that are kind of challenging in terms of getting to grips with the problem. Um, I, I do think, though, uh, the, one of the challenges for law enforcement and the military, frankly, because we know that a lot of the folks who showed up in January 6th were military veterans uh, and quite a few police officers, right? Um, the construct that we have right now when we think about domestic extremism vis-a-vis -vis law enforcement and the military is they're being infiltrated. Um, but that does not really reflect reality. Reality is there is kind of a dominant idea um, about what patriotism is within white supremacist oriented movements, whether they're stated or unstated, right? Um, and there's a dominant idea about, you know, uh, the role of the military and the police in enforcing, right, um, that, that normative um, idea of, you know, power and, and, and race. And so when we talk about, you know, the military and the law enforcement and infiltration and extremism, um, I think we have to be really careful because, uh, because it won't look like that to anybody who's sitting in, you know, a suburban Chicago police force. It will just look like, you know, a guy or a woman who really just loves the flag, right? Um, and really just loves, you know, his or her country. Um, and it won't sound like that. You don't need you know, swastika tattoos um, to, to latch on to some of these narratives and to be mobilized um, to, to look at, you know, people of a different race um, or creed or ethnicity in a very different way as potential targets for violence. It, it, I'll jump in here. Um, I, like Candace, I appreciate the effort, especially after, you know, doing this work for so long and having a federal government that didn't seem overly uh, concerned with addressing root causes. It's very refreshing um, to see those root causes at least addressed. Um, it, as far as the law enforcement tactic goes, um, it, in theory, I think it's a, you know, a good idea to get, you know, nobody should like, have to know about this stuff, <laughs> right? But um, for, for stakeholders that can help ensure public safety um, and, and you know, hopefully get ahead of potentially violent situations. I think this knowledge is really important. Um, so sharing that down at the local level so that, um, you know, law enforcement can recognize things happening in the community or, or, you know, receive some education on when those kind of beliefs can start to tilt into a direction that gets particularly dangerous. Um, you know, I think that's great information. But, um, you know, for that theory to work, you have to have almost this inherent trust of law enforcement generally. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't know that the events of the past, um, well, frankly, history of the country, uh, you know, really, <laughs> uh, you know, speaks to a, you know, omnipresent trust uh, that should be built out there. Um, you know, we certainly don't want law enforcement getting into the game of trying to like enforce against ideology. Um, but, you know, for this effort to be successful, I think there also has to be a fair amount of work of addressing sort of the ideologies, whether, 
you know, e even if they're not extremists, just sort of like the power structures and ideologies present in police departments and local police departments um, that, you know, could get in the way of accomplishing this work. Yeah, I, I think you're hearing some some common trends. Um, I, I likewise, I think it was an Im impressive focus. Um, and I think it's the there's a whole fourth pillar that focuses on root causes and long term drivers. But uh, especially from our perspective, a security focus, something focused specifically only on domestic terrorism and not the broader um, societal questions um, is always going to fall short of being able to, to, to talk about the ways we can tackle those together. So everyone has said the word trust and building off of what Sean said before. Um, and it, you know, it's because it's so essential for all the steps that could happen afterwards that could actually build like uh, something, mitigate some of these issues. Um, you know, we we do know from research that's more sort of social science focused on the impact of what we call in-group messengers. So being able to find, it, you know, um, uh, Sean mentioned that lots of folks at the Capitol may not trust conventional um, uh, uh, people, but there there are people they do trust and could have messages that would mitigate that drive towards violence. Um, uh, but to do that, we have to understand more um, about those dynamics. And I think that goes beyond just a security only response to these questions. Well, that prompts a very simple question. If Trump hadn't said go to the Capitol, would things have turned out differently? Uh, I think so. I'm curious what others think. I think it would have turned out differently. Um, you know, from timelines that have been put together by places like the Washington Post, we know that confrontations at the Capitol actually had already begun to start um, before the end of his speech. But I do think that, um, you, so in the, uh, you know, case, the first sentencing that we have had out of the January 6th trial, the, um, the woman who was convicted in her, you know, expressing her remorse said something that I think, um, you know, can really help us understand the dynamic of exactly what happened, which is that, you know, she herself believed, you know, I, I support Trump so much, you know, he's telling me to go to the Capitol. So that's what I'm going to do. We're going to protest, whatever. And then, you know, gets sort of caught up in this big sweeping thing. And part of the remorse that she expressed was that, you know, by her participation in going in and you know, going into the Capitol and walking around, um, it may have provided some room or some cover for more extremist groups or organized groups who had, you know, explicitly violent or um, insurrection type of agendas on that day. Um, and I think that kind of, you know, what she is telling prosecutors and stuff kind of really captured the dynamic that I think was at play that day, which is that you had some, a smaller subset of particularly violent, particularly nefarious actors um, who were seeking to create chaos and destruction that day. And then you had, um, and this is kind of what we've been talking about the whole time, this broader, uh, arc that was going and got aimed in that direction and provided the bandwidth that these groups felt comfortable taking action. We've got quite a few questions that have come in on the Q&A function. Please feel free. We're, we're going to turn to them now so we can get the audience. Uh, so let me start with a, a good question from Kendrick Nikornpen. Nicor what changes do you see in the QAnon community following the January 6th riot? Are they empowered or are they defeated? Do they, do they see the incident as a victory or a defeat for anybody who wants to jump in? I think it's super hard to generalize about QAnon. Um, I mean, you know, one of the things, so a couple of very good research outfits uh, have done some great work. I mean, Jared at uh, DFR Lab, um, you know, Graphica, you know, we everybody's been sort of looking at like what happened to QAnon when the bubble burst, basically. Um, the problem with trying to generalize about QAnon is that we're talking about potentially tens of people, tens of millions of people around the world um, who are now attached to this narrative. And, you know, I think Graphica, which is a New York based uh, research organization that works on disinformation, 
had a great um, observation in one of their reports, which is essentially, you know, you can't really call this a fringe movement anymore because it's so tightly tied with, you know, Trump and that wing of the Republican Party um, that it is mainstream, right? In the United States, um, it's just mainstream. You know, 17% uh, of people polled by Pew recently, you know, basically nodded their heads and said, yes, of course, there are child, you know, uh, child trafficking, uh, you know, monsters who are in charge of our government, right, which is a, you know, a primary QAnon narrative. So it's, it's really hard to generalize about QAnon. I think what we can say definitively is it is a movement that now has a life of its own. Um, it's going to be extremely difficult to, uh, to, to stop it from kind of spreading uh, until, you know, tech companies kind of get at this challenge of understanding the design flaws primarily. Okay, another good question from Kathleen Walsh. <clears throat> For those back in the classroom in the fall, what's the best to date resource you'd recommend to accurately inform and answer students' questions about what happened on January 6? Uh, I'd go back in, in part to what we were just talking about in terms of trust um, and start from whatever community you're in, um, thinking about what, what connects it to people's uh, students' direct lives um and uh and and where they, they'll be able to trust the resource and not dismiss it out of hand um based on perhaps the biases that they have in their own community um that's not a very uh helpful answer um off the top so maybe others have specific resources they've they've thought of that are accessible to students well, I, I think it's kind of part of the challenge right and i think it's it speaks a lot to the value of something like a select committee like uh representative pelosi announced this morning, which is, you know, A, being a fact-finding endeavor to fill in gaps, and also, Shannon, what you've been talking so much about, uh, which is, you know, generating a collective understanding, because I know DFR Lab has been doing research, uh, you know, Sean's been doing research, Candace has been doing research, you've been doing research, right? And we all kind of have our lanes, we all kind of have, you know, what we're looking at, what we're particularly interested in, but I don't know that there really is like one spot to go or one, you know, definitive thing that weaves it all together um, in a way that's like really easy to follow and understand. There's, you know, a kind of a whole mismatch of different institutions and organizations trying to, you know, color in their page of the coloring book. Um, but we need. I, I think there still is a, a strong need to collectivize those findings and uh, you know, come up with a way that's coherent to present them. Yeah, totally agree. I would, I would add to maybe to generalize beyond the six to talk about persuasion and information operations and those tactics that are used around misinformation in general. I mean, as, as all sides use, right? And the media uses and politicians use. So another way to ground this is to kind of look at the information environment and, and how, how do we um, present this content in ways that are manipulative. Um, and so to connect that to maybe the general environment today might be another resource. Um, and also just with QAnon real quick, I think, you know, QAnon is not going away because people found QAnon useful and found their participation useful. And until we address those needs or those gaps in those needs or reconfigure their calculation of value, they're not going away. They're going to continue to do what they're doing. And then they kind of end up kind of distorting some of that information further to make it still useful until it's no longer useful to them. Yeah, let me just quickly jump in because I, you know, Sean and I are both professors and, you know, I think to the professors out there or teachers out there who are looking to kind of connect with their students and, and try and elevate the conversation, uh, without doubt, um, you know, there have been a couple of congressional short briefings, um, right, that have been produced already. Um, those are going to be good sources because, you know, they're official. Um, I think in many ways they, they use the kind of classic form of um, just qualifying the evidence uh, and that's a good discussion for, you know, jumping off point for dis discussions. But to Sean's point, um, you know, we actually, with the Cronkite School at ASU, uh, we began actually with an interesting experiment with teaching people open source investigation techniques 
um, who are you know going to go on to become journalists. And it was, and we were doing this in real time while all this stuff was unfolding. It was fascinating, you know, just sort of chasing the data. Um, and I think what I learned from that experience is, you know, again, um, a lot of people just, especially students, you know, at the college level, high school level, they don't know um, that these are these influence operations have, you know, a shape. They have a form. They have a pattern. Uh, and they kind of tend to look and feel a certain way. And I think the more we can educate folks about that, um, that's a really good starting point. And actually, I, I think to even double down on what Candace says, she knows I love those teaching techniques um, too. Uh, but in, in looking at some of those individuals who are not affiliated with Proud Boys or Three Percenters who ended up at the Capitol on January 6th, they had engaged in a lot of these same trends, this arc that we've been talking about this whole time in ways that were concerning. So. You know, a couple of folks from Georgia who were um, intimidating protesters with weapons um, in, a year ago um, at demonstrations. And so I think, you know, students have the same lived experience of this last year and are trying to make sense of it all together at once, just, just like we are as researchers in a way. And so um, helping them to see that even through the narrative of an individual and how that links to so many of the, the, the big trends we've seen this past year that I think we'll be unpacking for a long time as a country. Question from Alex Stark of New America, which is how can the data you Garrett be most useful in terms of accountability and preventing similar future events, which connects to a related question. What kind of accountability do you think is appropriate for news entities that really leaned in and propagated the stop the seal narrative, like e.g. Newsmax, et cetera? I mean, we're seeing, a, I think actually one of the most underappreciated um, kind of moments in history was the day that uh, Dominion Voting Systems brought a lawsuit against Sidney Powell, uh, you know, Mike Lindell and, and Rudy Giuliani. These are, you know, each one of these $1.3 billion. And it is the first time that you've seen, a, you know, a pretty, you know, large scale company taking on the ramifications of disinformation um, in ways that you know regular media, be it Fox or ABC News, or just really couldn't uh, either because they're not uh, oriented toward that kind of storytelling, um, or simply they don't have the capacity. Right? They don't get. They can't get to grips with all these complexities like QAnon and all. What is all that stuff? Um, so I mean, I, I do think that th that will be another really interesting source of information for understanding. Uh, you know, how these influence campaigns were designed, how they unfolded. Um, you know, we don't know how it's going to turn out. The lawsuit may be settled. We don't know. Like the, the future is unclear uh, where that, that's concerned. But uh, without a doubt, I think those suits, um, you know, and Smartmax as well, uh, Smartmatic as well, which is the other voting um, uh, company, uh, elections uh, tech company, I think, you know, what they are challenging. <laughs> is this idea that you can just, you know, you can go on any old news channel and say stuff, uh, you know, and then, you know, jump on social media and say stuff that is, you know, false, um, groundless, and so damaging uh, as to make it impossible to live and work and, and just be in the world, uh, let alone do business. By this. One of my colleagues, Dan Gilmore here at ASU, says that, you know, the news is not sonography, but in many cases, we treat social media as a form of sonography. So just because someone posted something on social media does not mean it's worthy of reporting. And, you know, just like we have practices now that are emerging around suicidality, right, we don't present information about a death by suicide in, you know, in a way that causes further harm, right? How do we present mis- and disinformation in ways that um, do not continue to propagate that mis and disinformation. And, and also, how do we handle all of these takedowns from platforms? So for example, we have all these news stories that have tweets from Trump, but those tweets are gone. So now we have these like hanging, you know, uh, uh, news stories. So, um, and I think we also have to understand the recursive loop between social media and the mainstream media and even fringe media, as I would argue, like OAN is, fringe is potentially an understatement. But, um, there's a recursive loop between mainstream media and fringe media and social media, right? We source information from social media, then that gets put back, you know, onto the mainstream media, then that gets then sort of regurgitated and resourced back into social media. So it's this loop where we're kind of feeding 
uh, this content. And that, you know, for my colleagues that do work in journalism, you know, that there are a lot of questions about, you know, research and sourcing and all those things that social media changes some of that game, doesn't change some other parts of that game. But I think a big issue during the reporting of the election and beyond, and even before that, is that we just, anything that was posted on social media became newsworthy, and that caused a huge mess, and there wasn't a lot of accountability for that. Yeah, just just quickly picking up on that, I think um, the to the extent that um, false narratives about a stolen election uh, contributed to January 6th, they also contribute to this day to a lot of serious threats against elected officials, um, unelected elections administrators, um, and I think we, we mentioned at the top um, online to offline harm. Um, that's not just like individual lives who are who are damaged by that, but also big economic cost and security details. The, the implications of that are real. And I think being able to draw that line and think about where accountability stands for that is important too. And, and I'll jump in and just kind of, you know, make the point that um, a lot of these networks that were circulating this kind of mis and disinformation around the election. You know, there's been a, a lot of deplatforming of some of the you know most noxious actors or the, or the you know misinformation super spreaders, for example. But like the network is very much still in place and still very much like roaring and like white hot pumping misinformation, disinformation. Um, and, and I think you know increases to data, you know, could further the understanding because, you know, I, I think something that gets missed in a lot of conversations about some of this bigger picture is that, um, you know, these systems of misinformation and disinformation exist on a parallel track. Um, and it kind of gets to something that uh, Sean was saying, which is like the, um, I'll pick on somebody, I, the New York Times article debunking X, Y, Z, doesn't mean anything to a community that doesn't trust the New York Times, right? Um, so I think, you know, better access to data, being able to construct a more complete picture can help inform our thinking and our strategies as we, you know, ponder ways to sort of disrupt um, the gap between those networks a little bit um, and hopefully be able to, um, you know, earn back the trust or, or at least, you know, plant seeds of uh, truth in these communities and hopefully um, and it's going to be a long-term project but hopefully you know kind of turn the tide a little bit or at least make you know turn the roar down into a rumble one final question because we only had three minutes left from davis terman um you know was breaching the capital kind of part of the plan for some of the people who gathered there or was that was that sort of a spontaneous um, and what, to what extent was there, do you see planning for what actually happened as opposed to just, hey, we're going to gather there and it's kind of crowd dynamics, mob behavior kind of took over? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's any question that there was pre-planning by certain, you know, groups and factions and cadres and, um, but here are some signs that we, I think we picked up on before uh, the events of the day. Uh, one very small example, um, you know, there's a lot of chatter in certain telegram channels, you know, following like the Oath Keepers and um, a few other sort of more extreme elements, uh, not to fire the sh first shot, okay? And, and this, this comes from, um, you know, the start of the Civil War. Uh, there's this theory, of course, that the Confederate side lost because they fired the first shot, uh, I believe at Fort Sumter, Forgive me if my, my Civil War history is a little bit off, but uh, I, I seem to recall in the chatter scenes, you know, mentions of Sumter, um, right, as being part of kind of the mentality going in, um, so that essentially uh, the idea was to draw fire, um, to be the first to draw fire from, let's say, you know, the Capitol Police or uh, the military, whoever was going to be there, you know, on, on call to respond, so that the narrative would be, you know, this was self-defense. And you know, patriots, um, you know, should rise up, exercise their Second Amendment rights to fight a tyrannical government that is clearly suppressing its people using, uh, you know, unlawful or un unreasonable force against its own people. Um, that narrative was running through a lot of the chatter on Telegram, you know, on Parler, um, you know, 
against uh, with certain groups, right? Like some of the, some of these factions. So there was definitely an intentionality around that. And I don't think, and I do think, you know, just to kind of flash forward a little bit, you know, we're hearing all these rumblings about what might happen on July 4th, which has become like this new, uh, you know, holiday for, for rallying, you know, 1776 style patriots. Um, we're hearing about August 15th, which is another, you know, potential event uh, where, you know, either in QAnon circles or in other right-wing circles, uh, Trump will somehow be, you know, installed as, as president, even though obviously he has not been elected. So, you know, there's, I think a, a lot of the more extreme factions see January 6th as a jumping off point, as a beginning, um, and we should absolutely count on um, more events like this happening. And, and I think um, one of the things we were able to do on the day of January 6th and January, January 7th with the help of some folks here on this panel was to look actually not just in DC, but across the country at what was happening in state capitals and at state capitol buildings. Um, and and uh, DC was not the only place that a capital was breached on January 6th. Um, and there were, you know, we see what's going on in Oregon and elsewhere. Um, and there were precursors to that, especially at Capitol buildings prior to that. Um, so I think when you when you draw that together um, uh, it, in that picture, it's clear that 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 was happening around anti-COVID um, restrictions well before January 6th, and that on that day, it was actually quite widespread intentionality from certain groups uh, that were at state capitals around the country um, uh, to, to enter buildings um, in that way. And it's important to connect those, those, those dots um, beyond just the like most extreme uh, kind of elements. And I would like to say kind of putting some of these pieces together real quick that this is sort of QAnon and these related groups sort of acting like a social movement and trying to draw on the legitimacy of the same sort of structures of a social movement, the same tactics of a social movement. So, you know, being able to say second amendment, you know, making calls on leaders that their rights are being violated. So I think that's also an important tactic that's being used uh, in, in this shift and a way to uh, seek legitimacy in, in a way that, uh, social movements only can. Great, well, we're gonna to have to leave it there. We wanna, I wanna thank on behalf of the 122 people who uh, tuned in to listen to this conversation, wanna thank Candace, Sean, Shannon, and Jared for a very uh, lively, interesting uh, discussion, unfortunately, of a rather somber topic. Um, so we'll wrap the meeting now and we'll clap virtually for them. Thank you. <laughs>